I think we'll have a couple more people hopefully joining us and that will be great. But we got to get the commercials in. Rex made it. All right, Rex, good to see you. I'm always excited with everybody that's here. So one, there will not be class next week. Now, I still want you to come on Thursday night. Come for a little earlier. We'll feed you. And, uh, but all next week, we'll have an adult Bible study class. Um, so you, know, you can come and eat get to be a part of opening, watch the play, the skit that we'll do. The, um, and then uh, the, the adult class, I think, usually does Bible study and sometimes crafts. Does that sound right? Uh, I think that's what they do. Um, so crafts, does that sound right? Uh, I think that's what they do. Um, so lots of fun, but you can, you can have Bible study Sunday night through Thursday night next week. Um, and we do want to encourage you to come to Vacation Bible School and invite some people. We have a unique challenge this year. It's called uh, Stump the Staff, Slime the Staff. <laughs> now, who's the staff? Unfortunately, Chastity's not uh, agreed to this. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> By the way, Pastor Lagoon and Matt don't know this yet. <laughs> I'm going to pencil it in in their call documents. But <laughs> um, yeah, so then um, we're, I think we're going to get Paul Nielsen, Pastor Paul, to uh, ask medium level Bible questions. And if whenever you get it wrong, you get slime dumped on you. Now, I'm, I started studying already. <laughs> I've almost got the Bible memorized, so I should be good. No, no, no. But uh, I think that's going to be kind of fun. And we're trying to do the questions where we should know them but might not. Like, uh, imagine the question was, um, name all of Jacob's sons. How many of you, you know, <laughs> how many of you could name all of them? No. See, because I can't. So that's, I got to study that before. <laughs> Joseph and Le Levi and Reuben. Uh, Reuben, I always remember the sandwich. So yeah. I, mean, I will never forget that one. <laughs> but, but then, you know, I'm going to get bogged down after five or six. I, I don't think I'm going to get them all. So, you know, so that, that's, and, and we'll probably have a few easy ones. So everyone will get one or two and then they'll start getting harder and make it more fun. Uh, but that's uh, Thursday night, I think. And our, our goal is, we're, we're set at where we realistically can achieve it because it's more fun if we reach the goal. So it's 250 people. So we always get to 250 people. So I don't think it'll be a problem. All right. So um, also, I just want to tell you, so up here I brought from my collection. I, I was hoping James will come again and bring some more stuff. Um, but this is part of a woolly mammoth tusk. So it's the, the guy that we get it from up in Deering, Alaska, he searches the riverbanks and uh, every spring and finds uh, fossils. And he calls this bark because it kind of looks like the bark of a tree. But the, the, the ivory will end up in layers. There is Denise. Good, she didn't make it. So uh, this is just an example. Um, he doesn't give me the really good pieces because he sells that. That's how he makes his living. Uh, but but uh, this is a real nice piece. And this is a, a woolly mammoth tooth. And again, you see how it's split. Um, but that's a tooth from a woolly mammoth. So th the tusks, a lot of them are uh, more than 10 feet, uh, you know, could be 14 feet long, stuff like that. I, and I just think of how strong the neck muscles have to be if you got two of those way out there. By the way, if you irritate a woolly mammoth, those are good weapons. Because <laughs> you know, I would not want to uh, meet one uh, like that. All right. Um, also, ooh, got something special for you. There's, a, there's a, if, if you listen to the radio station a lot, you may have heard one guy call in. We call him Uncle Bear. I don't know his real name. That's what he goes by. But um, Uncle Bear um, said, you're having Bible school. I don't know how he knew that. He said, I want you to give away these. And so he brought me 75 hummingbird feeders that he makes. And it's, it's a real simple design, and he's got instructions inside. But um, I thought this is so cool. Um, so, you know, get, get, uh, they're out in the parish hall, there's 75 of them, so if you want more than one, take it, but, uh, but you'll make Uncle Bear happy if you take one. Yeah. Um, and, oh yeah, and then come Sunday, because Sunday is Christmas in July. 
So Hallmark, what are they doing this month? Christmas, Christmas movies. I see them on the TV in my house. It's like, this is July. Yes, Mary was watching a Christmas movie today. Yeah, All right, I'm just telling you, I, I didn't make this up. But uh, so uh, we're trying to compete with Hallmark. So we're, uh, <laughs> we're having. Conover Farmer's Market is doing Christmas in July this Saturday. Are they? What, so what does that mean? Tell me what that means. Um, well, I think we're supposed to have like in excess of like 30 or 35 vendors. Ooh. And um, with our roaming bee, we're kind of going back to last year's price. Ooh, our, sale prices. Yes, for our honey and candles and our personal products. So there might be some other people that have sales. All right, so you made money. Check out Conover Farmer's Market and the post office parking lot there. That would be good. Saturday. Mm -hmm. Saturday. Yeah. So but Christmas in July, real, realistically, it's an excuse to sing Christmas songs again. Because, we, you know, we have those Christmas hymns, we use them for like two weeks, and then we put them away. And, you know, and I don't know, you know, you can just think of, oh, come all ye faithful. I could sing that more than twice a, in a year, you know. So, you know, joy to the world. I could sing that more than twice in a year. So I don't know that we, I can't pack as many, I can't pack all hymns in there, but we got four or five, so it, I tried to pick ones that most people like. But that's this Sunday. All right, any other announcements? We got an extra one. Thank you, Sylvie. Sorry. Yeah, oh, it's okay. I'm, I, I like to pass on useful information. All right, so that's the commercials. Now we'll start the class. So I'm going to, uh, to do the same thing I did last time, but I'm going to do it in an abbreviated. S so I'm going to look, I'm going to read three verses in the King James Version and have select volunteers, notice volunteers, um, who will read it in whatever version you have. So, um, so that's going to start with um, Psalm 91, verse 13. Denise, okay. Um, and then uh, Psalm 44, verse 19. All right. L young lady in the back. I, I can't see who it is. Oh, there. Now I can tell. Abby. All right. So you get Psalm 74, 13 through 14. Can you handle two verses? Yeah. Whew. yeah. Whew. So, and so if you were here last week, these are going to sound like familiar, and I'm doing that on purpose because I'm setting it up. 44 what? 19. 19. If my handwriting can be read. So that's not a promise. All right. Yeah, 91, uh, 13. Okay. And I wrote the 13 twice to, because I couldn't read it the first time, so I wrote it a second time. All right, so I'm going to read it in the King James Version. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon shalt thou trample under feet. And, and remember that word dragon is the key word. Uh, King James Version, that's not the perfect translation for the word, but it's a more honest one than some of the new versions. Okay, now read yours. You will tread on the lion and the, the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. So they put serpent, snake, not dragon. Okay, so they just want to point that out. All right, and then the second one was Psalm 44, 19. Hang on, I got to get it. I didn't. All right, thou, uh, though thou hast sore broken us, this is in the King James Version, I, um, in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. Thou hast broken us in the place of dragons. All right, M Mary? But you crushed us and made us a home for jackals and covered <laughs> us with deep darkness. Yeah, jackals is how they translate it. Now, the word dragons is a good translation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and then... A jackal just doesn't seem as fierce as a dragon. Yes, it, it, it's totally inadequate translation. I'm just... The, in, in, you know, last time I made the point, the perfect translation of the Bible is not in English or Spanish or anything. It's the original languages. And so whenever you translate from one language into another, th there's a little bit of interpretation and personality and thoughts of the translator get put into the text. It's inevitable. You know, it's, that's just the way it is. So 
I, you know, they, we want our pastors in the Missouri Synod to understand original languages so you can go beyond NIV, ESV and, and say, oh, I, because sometimes there's a real deeper meaning that doesn't get translated at all. You know, it's, for example, the classic is the word love. In, in Greek, there's four different words that are translated love in English, drastically different. You know, from the sexual love between a husband and a wife to um, the, the love like for a, of a mother or a father for children to uh, friendship, Philadelphia, filio is, you know, kind of this friendship love. You know, so, but it all comes love, love, love. And you lose something because agape love, that's the love God has for us. And it's a, a love without strings. It's a perfect love. And um, so if you can't see that when it just says love, you don't get the full picture. All right. So then, um, and then that one other one was Psalm 74. I'm almost there. And this is two whole verses. So we thank you, Abby. Um, Thou has, didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Now, that, that's very interesting. Go, go ahead and read that now. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Yes, so now one thing I respect about what they did, they left Leviathan, Leviathan. And that's where we're going to be starting today, is we're going to be looking at what is Leviathan. Um, but um, notice Leviathan is what they translated a sea monster, what he, they called a dragon. But that word that is translated dragon in the King James Version and a whole variety of different things in ESV and NIV, um, that's the word that today, if I was translated, I would put dinosaur. Now, back then, that di the word dinosaur wasn't a word. It didn't exist. That's 1800s when the word dinosaur came about, when we come up with all those names for the different dinosaurs. So yeah, but the Bible has a category that is saying these giant creatures, you know, dinosaurs. And why this is so important to me is a lot of young people think that the Bible is inaccurate as a history book and all this because it doesn't match what, you know. Yeah, well, it taught everywhere. Every, every, you know, how many networks teach evolution on it? Just, uh, and I'm talking children's networks. Yeah, they all do. And, and, and so, you know, and then they see, well, the, boy, Adam and Eve, uh, where does it mention dinosaurs? Actually, it does, kind of, but, you know, it, it doesn't list all the animals. It just gives that general phrase. Yes? There's other words other than just dinosaur that are not, like, Trinity, the triune God is not specifically called that. Yeah, the, the word trinity or triune is not found in scripture, but the teaching is. So, you know, they have, they are describing what we today call dinosaurs, but they're doing it in words that, if you think about it, King James Version was when? 1600s. 1600s. So, what did they know about dinosaurs in the 1600s? Next to nothing. Now, they did believe in dragons because all the stories of the knights of the round table and you know the so so they're using giant creature they're using a word that would make sense to them no in the word dinosaur didn't come out to the 1800s yeah exactly so i mean obviously they're not going to put the word dinosaur there because why would they? And now by the time you get to the modern translations, the ESV and NIV, we've kind of gone to a modern understanding which is trying to modify the book of Genesis and make it seem like it matches with science. And actually, science needs to be changed so that it agrees with scripture. Uh, but that's, you know, because they don't, Oh, you'll see. We, I, I don't, I, I'm going to say. Through the Bible, though, and you, if you're a historian and you go through the Bible, you can find the ancestry that's said there. You can find that this war happened, that this battle happened. 
And well, so it really does match. Yeah, so if you, t if you took the Book of Mormon, which is about the uh, supposedly a lost tribe of Israel that settled in the United States and built these huge cities and, and everything, so um, how many of those l remains of those cities that are described in the Book of Mormon have ever been discovered through archaeology and history? Zero. And there are Mormon... <laughs> academic people that are drastically, you heard, you heard it talked about, even James did, you know, they're looking in the Middle East to find evidence of the lost tribe. They're, you know, they're looking everywhere to try and say, oh yeah, our book's accurate too. Now, archaeologists use the Bible to look for, all right, where is this city that, where it, that existed a long time ago? And they, and they look at what the Bible says, and that tells them where to go start digging, where to start looking. You know? Um, but if you're an archaeologist and you become, and, and you profess Christianity and say that it, it goes with the Bible, you're shunned from the... You, you don't talk about it, <laughs> you know. In other words, will they use the Bible as a, ref, a valuable reference material? Yes. But will they talk about that in front of fellow academic, ac well, whatever, you figure out the word. Yeah. Ac ah, it don't matter. What was it? Yeah, thank you. I can't say that word. <laughs> um, yeah. It's only speculation because you okay. weren't there, so you can't know. But do you think the dragons actually blew fire, or do you think that's just like folklore? I, I think that's the, the, the exaggeration. But you know what? When, um, for example, worldwide flood, how many societies, um, in fact, I think at the Creation Museum, maybe even at the, uh, at the Ark, they talk some, of, uh, some. how many uh, different societies have the story of the worldwide flood? Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, in fact, the China, yeah, and it, it, the symbol is the, it has to do with eight people on a boat. I mean, and the, the symbol for, you know, and it's like, why is it that now they have parts of it that don't match the scripture, but this idea of worldwide flood, eight people survive, that's found in all these different cultures. So, yes, you can find some exaggerations in, in how it gets changed. And you think of the game of telephone, which you used to do in school or youth group or something, you know. But there's, there's a core truth that that idea that there were dragons that's representing a core truth that not all the dinosaurs disappeared immediately after the flood you know we know some survived and you know then we got a major ice age and that means in large parts of the world the woolly mammoth and the, the, the mastodon um, in Alaska they were all over now, that wasn't, it became not ideal conditions even for them. Woolly mammoth is woolly, but it still became difficult for them to survive as the weather kept changing, you know, and they couldn't find fresh food, so they started to die out. Um, that's why you find all these remains still to this day, but it, just interesting. So I just wanted to establish that I, I see the Bible having a, a word that we could translate as dinosaur, and then it has particular names for types of dinosaurs. Leviathan is the one that we met in Psalm 74. And that's where we're going to look at now. So, um, yeah, let's look at the book of Job. So if you were in the book of Psalms, and I, I'm no longer going to use King James Version now. The book of Job is just before the book of Psalms. Uh, so Psalms is in the middle of your Bible, book of Job just before that. What is the book of Job famous for? His trials. Yes, his trials, and also for Pastor Laguton's men's Bible study class that spent like 14 years studying it. That is somewhat an exaggeration. <laughs> but they spent a long, what, what, isn't it almost? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a fascinating book, though. And so just to get you, so Job had all those terrible things happen. I mean, house crushed, loses his children, loses his cattle, loses his crops, loses, his, I don't know, painful boils, you know, almost every problem you can think of, every disaster, he had it all. And, and then 
he gives that great quote, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and I always think about that. You know, if I lost all of my children, would I be able to say a beautiful expression of faith like that? And the, the worst thing that happened to Job is he had friends that came to console him. <laughs> yeah, and, and so then uh, they said, well, what did you do to tick off God so big? You know, hey, well, you must have really sinned. Come on, tell us. You know, come on. We want the juicy stuff. That and his wife, his wife wasn't very supportive. Well, his, his wife was bitter. You know, when, when trials come, um, you either grow better or bitter, and that is reality. And Job and his wife, you see both responses. Um, so, but in, you know, so all that's going on, and eventually Job starts questioning the fairness of God. And then the, the, this part of Job that we're looking at, uh, we're going to look at 40 and 41 a little bit, um, is, is where God's answering. And it's interesting he doesn't answer the question. Instead, he establishes his authority. All right. So, um, so look at look at Psalm forty, verse. Oh, Job, Job, Job forty. Sorry, 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 sorry. Job forty, Job forty, verse one and two. I'm just setting the scene. The Lord said to Job, who, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. In other words, all right, you're saying all this stuff about me. Let's talk. Face, you know, and it's like, ooh, you know, now he's... But um, so now we're... The part for Leviathan, we're looking at Job 41. I will say the right book this time. Job 41, starting at verse 1. And I, I want, I'm going to read this whole section. I'm going to try not to comment much. And then I want us to read the footnote that goes with that section. And then I want you to, I'm going to try not to give my interpretation, my feelings. I want you to. All right, so ver, Job 41, verse 1. Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he be... Will he keep begging you for mercy? Will he speak to you with gentle words? Will he make an agreement with you for you to take him as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders barter for him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse him who then is able to stand against me who has a claim against me that I must pay everything under heaven belongs to me now the argument that God's making here is you look at this creature that I made and then you tell me you deserve to question me <laughs> now that's uh, yeah I, ooh, that's powerful now so what does it say in the footnotes of your Bible um, for, for what a Leviathan is Possibly the crocodile. Now, I've seen guys with their bare hands grab all the crocodile and wrestle them. Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, you know. So, so, you know, and I'm just thinking, could you harpoon a crocodile? Even a 20-foot one with a harpoon or a spear? Yeah, you could, you know. It's not that they're going to send fear in your heart. If you know what you're doing, you could kill a crocodile. I am not even going to try. I was once fishing in a nice, beautiful lake. I'm sure there were large bass there. Second cast out, I noticed eyes that were coming towards me, and I realized I was in waders about 15 feet from shore. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to fish here. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and the ranger says, don't, go, don't hit your ball to the right side of the fairway. Well, duh. <laughs> yeah, just I, I'll take the drop. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not saying I want to tackle uh, uh, an alligator or a crocodile, but I'm saying there are people who can. That They don't send shivers down everyone's spine. So when it says, can you fill his hide with harpoons? Now, a harpoon's a powerful weapon even back then. So you, are you telling me that they would be fearful to harpoon a crocodile? I don't think so. This is a joke. Why didn't they say sea monster at least or something like that? 
because they don't believe in that stuff. They don't believe that dinosaurs were around when people were. You know, they have an evolutionist point of view when it comes to history, and geology, and all that stuff. So the problem is, in the translations, we translate a, out the stuff that would help us really understand the scripture sometimes. And it, this doesn't happen a lot, but it happens more than you'd like it to. Sylvia looked up Le Leviathan, and it said a gigantic, powerful creature, or something like that. A gigantic, powerful, what did it say, Sylvia? In the Bible, tenon, teninin is the Hebrew term for Leviathan or sea dragon. Sometimes he is compared with Rahab, another sea monster who is especially so associated with the Red Sea. And Raha is evidently mentioned in Isaiah. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to look at Isaiah, too. So, um, but just, I do want you to see this beast that is described here. God's picking some of the most fierce beasts of all. He's not talking about a crocodile. And, and um, quite honestly, he's not talking about Loch Ness Monster type either. I mean, I have no doubt that would be scary, you know. But there were some, uh, in fact, if you looked at, the, if you saw the little post I put, I tried to get what a possibly a leviathan would look like. But, you know, this is like whale size animal or bigger. This is not crocodile size animal. This is bigger. And, you know, this mouth, if he grabs hold of you, it's not like a crocodile grabbing hold of you where they have to pull you under and drown you. I mean, half your body's gone in one gulp is the way I picture it. Um, so, um, and we have fossils of some of those gigantic sea dinosaurs, water dinosaurs. So that's kind of where we're going. But I, I wanted you to see this description. You know, the mere sight of him is overpowering. You see him, you run or row or whatever you do to get away from him. You don't want to be anywhere in the vicinity. Yes. Um, Denise was asking about the dragon and the fire and stuff. And this uh, little blurb that I have down here says, what is a dragon in the Bible? Abstract, in the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh is often depicted as a divine warrior executing vengeance against his enemies. Some of these texts employ the image of Yahweh as a dragon-like creature who pours forth smoke from his nostrils and fire from his mouth. Yeah, and you can think of, um the book of Daniel and the, and the book of Revelation have, uh, you know, this, this end times type discussions and some of the imagery they use of God to present him as strong and just and coming to judge, um, you know, the, you, you do get some of that. And of course, um, the dragon is used in the book of Revelation extensively as a picture of Satan because he's deadly. He's, you know, he's, he's a fierce, yes. When did they go from evolution being a theory, one of many, to evolution being a fact? It's never because been. it's never been a fact, but I'm going to tell you. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's they, what I'm saying. When did they? And, and the problem is. I remember being taught it was just a theory, and they gave a bunch of theories, but at some point, it was no longer taught as one of the theories. It was taught as. The theory. The yeah. theory, yeah. Evolution is a religion. You have to believe it. Well, it is, yeah. and, and it's based on humanism. Humanism is the ultimate part because I have to be able to explain everything without God. And for, for that, I need vast periods of time. I have to say, well, you know, we don't see the, the evolutionary changes within species that they're looking for, so it, but it happens over millions of years, and we can't see it in thousands of years, but in millions of years, it could have happened that way. Now, the only problem is mutations just about always, in fact, always, end up with uh, a weaker, not as a survival of the fittest. That would be causing someone to be have a, a genetic disease. Uh, something's missing. Something important is gone. And you, you, that's not survival of the fittest. So it, it is nonsense, but I'm going to tell you, so I was in the uh, studying to be a nuclear engineer, and this is a long time ago. Um, yeah, we had dinosaurs on campus, so I mean, it was a real long time ago. Uh, but, uh oh 
coming back, coming back. Um, but even then, see, in, in high school, a lot of my teachers would present evolution as theory. By the time you got to college level, it was presented as fact. You know, it's this, and when you're in the engineering, science and stuff, the physics, all that, it's fact. And, you know, you kind of got ridiculed if you questioned it at all. And see, you know that's bad science when you're not allowed to question it. Because science is always about, you know, it, it is about questioning things. It's about being, being able to show that again and again and again that it's correct. It's, it's observable and repeatable. That's the scientific method. We, you know, and when we can't question, when we can't offer theories in contrast, that's not theory, then that's propaganda. That's a religion. That is, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not scientific at all. And whenever they say you can't question this or else you will be fired from the faculty or you're, you will never be published again, that tells you it's a religion. And you have to fit in with my religion or else I, we got we to gotta stop you. You know what? If you're so confident that you have it figured out, then let everybody openly question you and, and give their interpretations of the facts. Because you know what? There are people that can look at the same things that evolutionists do, and I've read the arguments they make. They're strong. I mean, what finally convinced me, I, when I was studying, I, I know I, I share this story a lot, but I have to. When I was studying to be an engineer, I was questioning Genesis. I wasn't sure it could be true. I was trying to expand the seven days of creation into seven eras, seven time periods. And, you know, because I wanted to hang on to biblical faith, but I wanted it to fit with what everything was being told as fact. You know, I, I wanted, and, and the thing that convinced me was the laws of thermodynamics, because the laws of thermodynamics prove that the theory of evolution is nonsense, cannot be, it cannot happen. And I'm not going to go into the three theories, or the three um, parts of the, how oh, anyway, now I'm getting all tongue-tied. But I'm not going to go into that, but man, the, the, the laws of thermodynamics absolutely destroy any possibility of evolution being true from a scientific viewpoint. I mean, it's just, it's impossible. And that's when I became, for the, probably, for the first time in a long time, a true young earth creationist. I fully believe Genesis 1, I fully believe Genesis 2 and 3, and I believe that it's not millions and millions of years old. It's nonsense, it's garbage. But they have to have that or else they have to admit there's a God. And it, it, it's being jammed on our heads. And the sad part is we don't publicly say anything because we don't want to get shame. Rex, you can say something. Uh, several years ago, uh, Jennifer Bandy brought in some, Tam brought in some DVDs and I kept them at the house for a while, but we did a little class and a few people attended, but it talked about where a lot of this came from. It came back in the 30s, like with Dewey, we were, I all remember the Dewey Decimal System. Yeah. There was a bunch of thinkers, like at Columbia University, or people that controlled the education system, and it just gradually permeated, permeated in there. If you go back into history, you realize back uh, with when uh, Roosevelt started accepting Keynesian economics, which is basically a socialist or Marxist ideas, but a lot of those thinkers, and like Freud and things like that, the, the, those thinkers that started permeating into the education system and it trickled down from yeah, higher education down that. into ours. That's why the, uh, the school boards are now where the battles are going to be won. Yeah, in, in fact, quite honestly, if, uh, you know, the, all right, Robinson, Mark Robinson, who is that? Lieutenant Governor, my hero, by the way. Yeah. I, I wanted to hear him speak, and, and he, what he was talking, it was a pastor's gathering, so I, I went, and, and one, I love him. He's a preacher. I mean, he can, and he, he is not political in nature. He's in a political office, but he, he speaks from here, you know, and he doesn't care if he's politically correct. But his main point was uh, we've got to get Christians to run for office because otherwise we're going to 
we're gonna lose everything. And you're right, county commissioners, uh, city councilmen, and school boards, that's the crucial battle. I mean, yeah, we, you know, there's other battles, other levels, but we need Christians to run. And you can think, right now, it would be real easy for, for Christians not to run. Who wants to get your name smeared? Uh, Mark Hollow um, was, is a member of our church. He ran in the last election, lost, and he, he didn't mind losing, but the thing that bothered him was some of the lies that were told about him. They, they came right out and said he was pro-abortion. Now, I've known Mark Hollow for 20 years. He's pro-life, always has been, always will be. But, they, I mean, they're smearing him, you know, and you know, who wants to run then? But if we don't, then... Too early, I started to get into that. It's like that's why going back to Genesis is so, it's been so important. Like I had out Bible class, yes. because <laughs> Genesis points back to that. That's the foundation of our faith. All the other religions, the theories, or other religions have to make the Bible conform to what their teaching is. But, the, but we're supposed to conform to what the Bible teaches. Yes, yes. Sir. All right, Denise, you had your hand up. I, I was just. I don't remember now. <laughs> I will try to get to you sooner, and I apologize sincerely. Please love me still. <laughs> Pretty sure she will. All right. Um, so, yeah. All right. Look at um, Psalm 104. Uh, we're we're going to just look at a couple more passages about Leviathan. Because you saw him in Psalm 74. You see him in uh, Job 41. Psalm 104 has a little section on it. And then there's one in Isaiah. Um, Hey, go ask. Remember when we would listen to the Jonathan Park series? Yeah, and that was uh, was from that, a creationist point of view. It was, was that great. based off of real scientists that were kicked out and yes, and their families harassed and stuff. Yes. So that actually happened. So there was a guy who published uh, something questioning the theory of evolution and like. Uh, it was peer-reviewed, the facts were, were accurate, but it got published in a uh, scholarly journal, and when the scholarly journal got in trouble for questioning the theory of evolution, and he lost his job, you know? So, I mean, that stuff is real. I mean, that, that's real. Um, I think he worked for the Smithsonian, actually, and, you know, the Smithsonian, if you go through their exhibits, there's a lot of evolutionary viewpoints in there. And I love the Smithsonian Museums. I, they're great, but there's propaganda in there, too. I think it's not close to us, but I just remember our oldest when she went to Lenore Ryan, and she had a class with a pastor, and he told her that if she believed everything in the Bible, that she was wrong. She was an idiot. Was she was an wrong. idiot. And then he also told her that by 2025, which isn't that far away now, no. that dogs would be driving cars and <laughs> having jobs and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> and walking And who's the idiot? That's my <laughs> point. <laughs> but that just blew my mind when that was a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, that's the world we live in. You know, and, and that's not all pastors and it's not all denominations, but there's, some have sold their soul because they're trying to conform the Bible to society instead of trying to convert society to biblical thinking. And that's the mistake. All right, Psalm 104, starting at verse 24. So how many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you formed to frolic there. Now, why does it, you know, the only one mentioned by exact name is Leviathan. Why do you think that is? It's talking about God's creation, all the animals in the sea, teeming with life, all that. Why is it? It's huge because my thought is being out on the ship, you're in the middle of the ocean. You ain't necessarily next to the shoreline. And here's this big creature frolicking yeah. in the sea. 
Did you see, um, there was a, uh, a small boat that had a whale jump, you know, and you like it when it surfaces near you, but it surfaced right near him and landed on the front of the boat. <laughs> That would be scary. Well, imagine you see a leviathan, uh, you know, surfacing right around your ship. Uh, that would scare you. But I think, why is this mentioned? Because that was the greatest of the sea creatures. You know, so he, why do they only point out that one particular? Because he's at one end of the spectrum. You know, that, that's how I look at it. All right, and then one other passage, um, Psalm, or not Psalm, Isaiah 27, Isaiah 27. So Isaiah is shortly after the book of Proverbs. So you go Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah 27. So in that day, and this is talking about the when God comes again, kind of the end, you know, God is uh, Isaiah 27, what? Um, verse one, verse one, it's right at right at the beginning. I'm I'm so I'm not I'm get so excited about this. I skip basic things like telling you where. <laughs> in that day, the Lord will punish with his sword, his fierce, great and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent. He will slay the monster of the sea. Now, again, that does not work with crocodile. <laughs> you know, that, that's nonsense. This is not a crocodile. And, and why is this the, the ultimate enemy that God's, you know, this is about the strength of God. And God is so strong and powerful and mighty, he can even defeat the Leviathan. This is, this is one of the most fierce, scary, ferocious, large beasts. You know, this is not a crocodile, and crocodiles scare me, I admit it, you know, but uh, this is something bigger and badder than that. Um, and that's why, you know, why is this being used as a reference point again? Because it's showing the greatest of God's work. And it, it, if you want to go in massive size, this is it. You know, this is it. So what, what's the largest sea creature that we know of today? Whales. Probably whales, right? Although they say there's some squid that can be giant size, um, I guess, theoretically, octopi or, you know, something like that could be too. I think squid grow larger than uh, octopi. I think that's right. If you're saying plural of octopus, sounds right. <laughs> Um, but I, I just want you to see that, you know, this can't be crocodile. This is a dinosaur. That's what we would call it. All right, we okay on that? All right, then let's look at another type of dinosaur that is named in the Bible. So now you've got to go back to Job, Job 40. So Job is right before the book of Psalms. Job, Job 40, we looked at Job 41 pretty much. And, and again, I'm going to try to read without editorial comment this whole section. And then I want someone to read the footnote. And then you comment, because <laughs> I'm trying not to make you think my way. I, I want you to think it on your own. So Job 40, um, starting at verse 15. Yeah. Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. So what is a behemoth? It's an animal. Yeah, it's a land dinosaur. And, and this is going to be massive land dinosaur. So think the biggest land dinosaur that you can think of, and that's what this is, um, in which feeds on grass like an ox. Now, it's a vegetarian. Whew, that's good. I feel better, you know. Um, what strength he has in his loins. So what are loins? Feed like his back legs. Back legs? Okay. I don't know. I don't think I have them, or I don't have strength, so that can't be, yeah. What power in the muscles of his belly? That's not me again. <laughs> and no, don't be pointing at anyone. <laughs> no, well, Tony has it. Yeah. His tail sways like a cedar, and I want you especially to notice that. I'm not making an editorial comment, but his tail is like a cedar tree. And how big is a cedar tree? 
I mean, trunk. Massive, length massive. Okay, just wanted to get that in there. Uh, <laughs> I'm giving editorial comment, I'm sorry. Um, I can't even pronounce that word, the what? Sinews. Sinews. You're a nurse, so you have to learn that. Sinews. <laughs> the sin yeah, tendon. I, I'm going to call it the tendons of his thighs are close knit. Wow. His bones are tubes of bronze. Now, if you think of a massive dinosaur, think of the weight that the bones have to support. You know, you think of four legs. Think of how strong those bones have to be just to support the weight of the animal. Um, his limbs like rods of iron. He ranks first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with a sword. So here again, we're seeing he's describing the largest land dinosaur as a point, God's mightier. And by the way, in Job, why are you questioning God? <laughs> why are you questioning God when God is mightier than the behemoth. The hills bring him their produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plant he lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal him in their shadow. The poplar, yeah, we don't need this part. All right, but look, oh yeah, we do need this part. Um, verse 23, when the river rages, he is not alarmed, he is secure. The th Though the Jordan should surge against his mouth, can anyone capture him by the eyes or trap him or pierce his nose? And it's comparing to, again, animals that can be domesticated. You know, there's a lot of animals we domesticated. Um, no one domesticates the behemoth or the leviathan. The leviathan is not going to be a cute little pet that you give to your daughters, as it talks about. One of the things when you visit the ark is that it now puts into your head how they could all be in an ark for that long together. Because as a preschool teacher, we would read silly books where, you know, the elephant had to be asked to hold still or he'd rock the boat, you know, just stuff like that. So you really had no, like, idea of how it could be done. And when you actually go see the ark, it's just so, like, it's like, oh, that's how they could do that. It's amazing. It is, and it's like, that's how, that's how they could do that, you know? Yeah, he, he, and he, I think they were so much more intelligent then than what we are now. Well, if you live 600 years, you would be pretty smart. Well, and I think they used what they had better, because now we rely on computers and different things like that, and they had to figure out. All right, how many of you can many use a slide rule? I, I used to. I don't think I could anymore. I don't think I remember it. Or an hibiscus or whatever that is. Okay. Can you do that? Say, I can't. I didn't, I haven't. You know, but we had ways of doing things. My dad made sure I learned mental math. He could do math in his head. And, and he wanted to make sure I could do that, too. Uh, you know, n nobody does that anymore. But if you look, we, we try to say our, our ancestors were cavemen, kind of brutes, nothing, you know, half, half, half animal, half people, but, you know, didn't have real intelligence. When you find the oldest fossils of human beings, you know what? Their brain capacity is larger than ours. <laughs> it's not smaller, you know. Over how he built the ark, or how the pyramids were well, built. In, in, in Genesis, you find there are metal workers, there's farmers, there's all these things. When, you, when you're a blacksmith, now we have lasers and, and computers to do all this work, metal work. There, you you did it by your strength and by your intelligence. You know, a glass blower. Uh, when we were in Italy, we got to tour a glass factory or whatever you call it, where they're blowing glass. And what an art form, especially to make it artistic, you know, not just functional. And it, it's unbelievable. Well, those skills go way back. And today, you know, c could I do the stuff that, any of the stuff that Noah did? No. I'm not allowed to play with power tools. I'm not allowed to use a hammer hardly, you know. Jackie, you're mean. <laughs> yeah, too many fingers get good. But, but, but yes, yeah, so. About it, even think of construction workers. And if you look at Doug Travis, he is a craftsman. And what he builds, he builds with hammer and nails, and he, he's a craftsman. 
And there's a lot of people out there that have no clue even how to use a hammer, even though they're carpenters. Because nail guns. A nail we got a nail gun, yeah. I broke one of those. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm not allowed to because every so often in emergency rooms, who do they get? People with nails in different parts of their body from a nail gun. You trip while you're holding a nail gun and all of a sudden you got a, a nail shot into your thigh or something. Yeah, I, I know. I'm not allowed to. I, I have my limits. But, but anyway, my, my point is, you know, we have this view that anyone before us was stupid. Um, it's kind of opposite. And we have technology, and, that, and that's a great thing. But, you know, long division. I don't know anybody, you know, does, do kids even get taught it anymore? I don't, because I, I mean, you use your phone, it's got a calculator built in. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Well, yeah. okay, let's just put it simply. How many people in here know? more than five phone numbers. Like, no. Oh, I still my phone number growing up. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know my because one. there's a lot of phone numbers. Jenny, like, Jenny, 8675309. I got that one. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of yeah. times when you don't have your phone, you can't call somebody. I cannot. I, don't, don't I, I know Denise's phone number. I know the church's phone number. I know the church's fax number. I know my phone number. 911. I know 911. <laughs> you know, you're helping me. my phone one day, and I've got a house phone. I yeah, I know. I still know our old house phone number, but I don't. You, know, you don't know your children's it. phone numbers. I do not know my children's because Devin changed his phone numbers all the time. So well, but trying. David, Joanna, yeah. I mean, I would, I would. But yeah, and we used to. You used to only have to know four numbers for a while there, and then you had to know uh, seven numbers. Uh, you know, now you got to know ten numbers and. Uh, Anyway, all right. Um, so, all right. So we read this part about the uh, behemoth. What does the footnote say? Hippopotamus. hippopotamus or Possibly the hippopotamus or the elephant. Now, I want you to think of the tail of a hippopotamus and the tail of an elephant. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think about it, when I was growing up, we talked about the brontosaurus, and now that term is gone. We have new ones, but um, Allosaurus. But there's, there's different levels of the same dinosaur family, and there's one, and I can't remember what it is, but there's the one that's the biggest of that Brontosaurus. Allosaurus family. That's what this is. The, you know, and I, I want to call it Gigantosaurus, but I don't think that's good. I, it could, I don't know. Some, someone, will, you got smartphones. Brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus? Okay. That, that is it. Denise, you. You're full of it tonight. I'm full of it every night, Denise. <laughs> Sad but true, yes. Yeah. It definitely can't be a hippo or elephant. Yeah, I mean, but it's ridiculous. A hippo's tail, even if it was uh, has uh, got smaller over the centuries, it's not going to be like a cedar tree. You know what hippo could move his tail if it was the size of a cedar tree, and and. All right, someone look up. I'm serious. What, Brachiosaurus, how, how long and high and how much to? 98 feet long. Now, an animal that size could, could have a tail the size of a cedar tree. An elephant could not. <laughs> By the way, how, how long is an elephant's tail? It's little. Well, it can swat flies a little bit. I mean, but it's, it's not... It's, it's not even like a branch of a cedar tree. You know, the, by the way, some of those branches of the cedar trees are like trees themselves. I mean, it, it's just, so I, I wanted you to see the Bible is not primarily a biology book. It's not primarily, you know, any of that, but whatever it speaks of is true. You know, so it doesn't tell us everything about the structure of the cell, but when it talks about animals and, and, and stuff, it speaks truth. So this stuff is true. And what we tried to do is explain it away and make it, we doubted scripture. So remember when uh, in Columbus's day, not everyone did believe this, but many thought the earth was flat. Yeah. What, those who d thought the earth was round, what was that based on? <laughs> scripture. The scripture describes the earth as a sphere hanging in space. 
So even though the, you know, we can't imagine, we didn't understand gravity, we didn't understand all kinds of stuff, but the Bible was right all along, but we didn't believe it. You know, and, and that's, yeah, go ahead. What did you say about Scripture about being round? Um, it, it talks about the earth as a sphere. Hey? Are you sure? Yeah. What's, what, what, which one's that? I'd have to look it up. I'm Isaiah 40, 26 says it's a circle. Yes. Well, it, it says it hovers over the circle. It doesn't say anything about round or sphere. Well, that Hebrew so word. If you look up Job 38, 15, that'll show you that it's flat. The earth is flat. If you, if you really believe the Bible, the earth is flat. You can't have, you can't stretch out the heavens as a curtain over a sphere. Only do it. Now your firmament is like a dome. Yeah. If you do a dome and it's flat, you can stretch out the earth heaven as a curtain. Yeah. But in both sides. You can't do that. I'm thinking of it. You can't. Read it. Read Genesis. Well, I, I have. So what? So so where? So where's the sun at? All right. Where is the sun? No. Is it 93 million miles away? Yeah. It is. And is it still in the firmament? Nope. The Bible says it's in the firmament. And your point is? <laughs> well, you said it, you said it was a spear, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's hanging up a spear and a, and a round spear. Nowhere in the Bible it says it's a spear or round. It's a circle. God can't get that wrong. If it's a circle, it's a circle. Well, not a not a spear. So that's where that n knowledge of the original that's language King, is. That's the King James Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just saying. The knowledge of the original language, that could be, and I would argue. Yeah, but, but if you believe the sun is 93 million miles away, but the Bible says you put two great lights inside the firmament, in, the moon and the sun. Now that's again, that's based on the translation. That's based on King James. Yes, that's based on the King James version of the Bible, which is the translation from the original. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not really wanting to dispute, yeah. uh, be, but my point is the Bible's always right. You're not arguing with that, really. So, so but it, it comes down to, so here's what I need. I need Paul to come here next time we meet. On, well, he won't be here. But um, I'm going to get a Hebrew scholar, because he can answer those questions better than I do. I did not have to study Hebrew. So I study Hebrew through books. You know, in other words, I, I have uh, a Hebrew English Bible, and that means I can find the Hebrew word and I can look it up in the books, and that's how. So that it it doesn't come natural to me; it's easier. What are you? Which one are you looking up? Because you can read it. I, I'm I like good discussion, so. Stand out like those of a garment. Yeah, verse 16, he's saying. No, oh, I'm saying. Uh, 14. 14, 14. 14. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. Yeah, and that's, see, that's, he's using King James Version, and then you go to, what was it, is that yeah. NIV or ESV? NIV, yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of this is in the translation you either gain or lose things you know that that's the hard part that is the hard part and um so but the broad point is exactly the same you know when the scripture speaks of these the leviathan and behemoth it's accurate this is not myth this is not you know the word dragon has a different understanding today than what it did when it was used in scripture but it's, it's speaking the truth. And do dinosaurs, did they exist at the same time as humans? That, yes, because Genesis tells us they were created at the same time. 
you know? Um, so in, is there fossil evidence to support that? Yes. In fact, I'll, I'll bring some when we meet the next time. So we meet in two weeks, but, um, and then next time I want to talk about the arc some, because the arc is the key thing to what happened to the dinosaurs. So we're going to look at the end of the arc especially. We won't go over everything, that's fascinating, um, but we're going to talk about, so what happens after the arc? Um, you know, because the animals get on, so that would have been two Brock, Brachiosaurus? I'm not saying it the same way you did. All right. What he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two of those. Now, how big were they? They would have been, babies. yeah, babies. And over a year, they would have grown bigger, but they wouldn't be, when, when you're hearing 98 feet long, that's like 20 years probably. That's a long time uh, because they're, you know, reptiles. So, but. When you look at what happens with the ark and what happens after the ark, that's where everything kind of makes sense. And because what evolutionists can't explain is where do all these dinosaur fossils come from? So if, if dinosaurs. yeah, well, thank you. That is very, you're very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if, uh, if uh, uh, my cat kills a mouse in the, in the yard and I don't discover it, will that mouse end up fossilized? Probably not. What's going to happen to it? Decay. Yeah, I mean, the flesh is for sure is going to decay. Do bones decay? Yeah, yeah they kind of do because they get eaten by these little microscopic animals. So, yeah, normally bones don't become fossils, except under certain conditions, like after a flood. Ooh, yeah, baby. So we're going to talk about all that. All right, anything else we need to talk about for tonight? So we meet in two weeks, not next week, although please come. Please come. Especially next Thursday, Tony's going to be starring in this unbelievable Broadway production. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> And Mary, you're still as a possibility on there. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your clear word. Help us to uh, submit our thoughts to your word instead of to what everyone else is saying. And then help us to share your word with the world so that others may hear and believe. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right.